in September of 2016, Steve Manders came to us to talk of Eastern Ontario Railways and ended up telling us about the water transportation system in the area. When we mentioned the Mississippi Mora rail system, he was so surprised and he returned to, on his own to discover it. He was so amazed he stopped the first production of his book that he was currently writing, and it's over here, the first spike, about early Eastern Ontario railways to include his initial findings about our Maznot Pringle tramway. <clears throat> Since that time, Steve, Steve has come back many times. He's researched and drawn conclusions about what happened up here in 1882. The mysteries of the Gilmore family and how they operated here in our area are at the least intriguing. Ken Hook and Glenn Pierce helped Steve originally locate the area, and then Kevin Goodfellow joined Steve with his metal detector and his shovel. Through visits to the land title offices and contact with Gary Long, the author of When Giants Fell, Kevin and Steve have been able to put the pieces together. Steve's wife, Myrna Manders, has very early roots in this area, and hopefully he shall tell us a bit more about them. One of the earliest gravestones in the Northbrook Cemetery is that of J James Pressler, born in 1831. <clears throat> Steve is a true historian who leaves no stone unturned. He takes his thesis and tests it in every way possible before coming to conclusions. Impressively, he's not afraid to say I was wrong on that one and to start all over again. <laughs> his enthusiasm is catching and his curiosity is endless. The Cloyne District Historic Society and the Cloyne Pioneer Museum Archives are indeed the fortunate recipient of the artifacts over here that he's unearthed and the creation of his model and his presence here today. Well, next. Well, it is a great pleasure to be back here. I've had a wonderful time uh, working on this project. I don't think uh, that we're going to find another project as interesting. I love the Canadian Shield. I've tracked down 62 ghost railways of eastern Ontario. If I was in southwestern Ontario, it's all built over, it's all farmland. I couldn't do the project there and it wouldn't be nearly as pretty. In this area, the Skillmore Tramway, it was undocumented when it was built. There are no records of its ever existing. Uh, a few comments that some people remember it did exist. Uh, but I found it untouched after a hundred years. This is a rare opportunity to find something of this magnitude untouched for a hundred years. Now when you're singing the National Anthem, it reminded me of a little story. A little boy went to school the first time. He had to sing, God Save the Queen, and when he got home from school, his mother asked him, well, how did your day go? And he said, well, fine. When we sang, God Save the Queen, I didn't like the part about the people being hit by the train. <laughs> she said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know that line of a long train run over us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the end of the humor. For now, we get on with the, the serious history. Now, uh, Carolyn mentioned uh, my wife's ancestors are from this area. Her father left here at age five in 1910. His father would have worked in this area as a logger. They lived on Bastonbury Road. Everybody, all the farmers, would have worked in the logging industry in the winter and in the spring. It's highly unlikely that they did not work for the Gilmore and Company. And it's very likely he even worked on the jack ladder. There's no documents of any of that happening. It's highly unlikely that it didn't. Some of the other railway artifacts I've tracked down, and I'd like to go for the oldest stuff that's the hardest to find, the stuff that no longer exists, and pull it out of the ground. Over here is a chart of the various rails of the uh, earliest railways, wrought iron, bridge rails, cast iron. And my most recent acquisition, the original mile of the Kingston Pembroke Railway laid in Kingston in 1873. That rail is three and a half inches wide, three and three quarter inches high. Try and find one of these today in the city. It was made by C.M. Avon Works in England, so for Bristol, west of London. Go find a rail when you don't even know they exist. That's my game. This is the same here. Anyway. 
on with the Gilmore Tramway that fits that model very nicely. The picture I have depicted here, whoops, did have depicted there, is as close as I can find to what I believe was actually happening. Now, the Gilmore Tramway consisted of a jack ladder, which is depicted over there in the diorama, taking logs from Mazinaw Lake that were brought down the upper Mazinaw River, Bear Creek, floated down Mazinaw Lake, taken over to the Vibe, just one kilometer south of Bonacqua Provincial Park, to Pringle Lake, floated down the Scudamana River, the Moira River to Belleville, where a tugboat picked up the logs to take them to the largest sawmill in the world, which is in Trenton. It was a big mistake making it so big it could process a million board feet of lumber a day if they could only get the logs. They never could. There's no sawmills in Canada that can process a million board feet of lumber a day, even today, even in BC. But that was the big mistake, and so they had a major program getting logs from all over Ontario. Now the Gilmores built another jack ladder up at Dorset on Lake of Bays, and they floated logs 445 kilometers from the west end of Algonquin Park to Trenton. The problem was they had to go over several divides of land, and the first logs took two years to arrive, and only half of them did arrive. And that was a disaster when you have this big sawmill waiting for timber. But we do know that the men who built the one in Dorset had a lot of experience, and the only place they would have got experience was here, on the Mazinaw Tramway just north of Cloyne. So we know the names of the people that worked on it, even though it wasn't recorded at the time. We know from where they ended up that they had to be here. This picture here shows the horses going in single file on wooden rails, pulling a wagon with a big log. That particular wagon has eight wheels. I have a specimen of a wheel here, we believe from their wagon, is found at Pringle Lake behind the McKeever's Cottage. I believe is the wagon wheel. It was three feet in diameter, cast iron. It ran on steel strap, wooden rails. There's a steel strap with square iron spikes. The head stood up and it rolled along that. It was better than on rough ground sinking in mud when you got tons of logs on it. So I believe that could be something else, but I believe that is their wagon wheel. So that is not of the Gilmore Tramway, but I believe it accurately depicts what they did. Okay, a little bit on the history of the Gilmores. Came over from England, they started working on logging up the Ottawa River, worked on the, they had a big sawmill in Chelsea, Quebec in the 1830s, they worked their way up the Mississippi River. They took a lot of squared pine timber to England, and the reason it was squared is they could pack more of it in the hold of a sailboat to take to England. The local sawmills used whole logs and they could square them at the sawmill and if they were using wood for power, for fuel, of course they could use the scrap wood off the log. So local sawmills did not use square timber but there were some taken out of here to go to England. I can't read that. Okay, Gilmore's they operated another, okay, this is the one page out of the book, uh, the Gilmore Tramway at Dorset. He has one page about this tramway. So he just mentions they had another tramway, and they used in the 1880s, the 1890s, and perhaps as early as the 1850s. Well, perhaps means exactly that. The truth is, you'll see in a few minutes, the Gilmores did not buy the land for the tramway until April the 17th, 1882. I have the deed over here where I picked up at the land registry office. He would not have put that jack ladder on Crown land or somebody else's land, so the jack ladder and the tramway have to date from 1882. Even though they were logging in this area in the 1850s, taking logs down the Mississippi River. So there's two issues. How long were they logging in the area, and when was the jack ladder built? So they knew the area well, they needed more timber for their big sawmill in Trenton, so they built the jack ladder to take the logs over the divide down the Moira River. It says in the middle there, uh, the uh, cars ran on wooden rails uh, up on the stone uh, runway. 
through swampy terrain. This is true. It says, though, it could operate because they used rails, not water. They could run for a longer season. But if the Scudamatta River through Flinton has run out of water in the summer, you can't run logs down whether you've got a railway, a tramway here. You've got to have water in the Scudamatta River. So I disagree with that one comment. Like all of the waterways, you need water in the waterways or the logs don't move. Makes no mention of iron straps on the wooden rails. This is out of the book, A County of a Thousand Lakes. It's about an inch thick book. It is a very comprehensive book. If you haven't got one in your library, you should get it. It's stories, it's got a thousand authors, but Brian Rawlison is the editor of it. It's a Frontenac County Historical Committee, 1982. And what it's talking about the Gilmore Tramway, it says local memory. Well, nobody from 1882 remembers it. <laughs> okay, the tramway was built to carry square timber from Mazinaw over the height of land to the Scudamata. Square timber did not go down the Scudamata River to the sawmill, the stake. To the Bay of Quinty, it was just rounded logs. If Gilmore built it, it must have been constructed before 1862 when there was a bit of a land swap. Well, that's 20 years, a whole generation, before this tramway was built. So that land transaction in 1862 is irrelevant to the Jack Ladder tramway system. So while it's mentioned in this book, I have to disagree with everything that is mentioned with the evidence you will soon see. Gilmore did not build his sawmill until 1883, sorry, yeah, 1883 is when he built it, and he needed a lot of logs. This is the quick clean deed I picked up at the land registry office. Now, you may think sometimes civil servants are a rather laid back bunch, a little slow, hard to cooperate. I went into the uh, Service Ontario office in Kingston near uh, on Division Street near the 401 Highway. And they do all head cards, drivers, licenses, and everything else. And I thought, well, this is going to take a little work. I showed the lady what I wanted and why, perked her interest. She left her booth for a couple of hours while helping me. And I let the other clerks take care of the rest of the public. So anyways, it took a lot of work to figure out exactly what we're looking for, how to find it on rolls and rolls of microfilm. But anyway, there is the original handwritten deed for the land for the Gilmore Tramway, the Gilmore and Company bought it from Mr. Weiss on April 17th, 1882. He would not have put his tramway and jack ladder, which you see modeled there, on land he did not own. So that establishes the date it got built. Up till now, it was from local memory. And there's the last page of the handwritten deed. Now, it was very difficult reading that. Try it as I might, I could pick up some words, many others I couldn't. So I sat down and with a friend we worked it all out and I typed it out. Uh, what does the quick claim deed say? So anyways, up at the top it's quite clearly April 17th, 1882. Uh, from uh, David, David Weiss and Gilmore and Company of the town of Trenton aforesaid lumber mention of the merchant of the second part. And for a fee of $45, he bought the five acres of land. Now, he could have bought the jack ladder from somebody else who built it, if it wasn't documented, but you wouldn't get a jack ladder of that complexity, an engine house, steam engine, a house, two barns, all up and operating for $45, which is a week's labor for an unskilled laborer. Therefore, there was no jack ladder on it in April 17, 1882, that had to come after. Anyways, uh, down further, it describes the survey. Starting at Mazinaw Lake between lot 30 and 31, he doesn't say what you're looking for. And heading west, he doesn't say what angle. You go up the hill to a post. It's a wooden post. Why don't you go find that wooden post? Then you go north, it doesn't say how far or what angle, to the next wooden post. Well, I did find some fences and lines that fit with some other modern surveys, and worked it out that it was six acres of land, not five. 
Now this was an Ontario provincial land surveyor that wrote up this deed, giving neither exact directions or distances, and he's off by a whole acre out of five. But nonetheless, that's the deed. So there's the Quint Twain deed. It was sworn on April 21st, 1882. And this is the back side of the deed. And it's between Lease, Gilmore and Company, uh, deed of land. So there's no question about when did this thing start? When was it not operating? That's been the big questions I showed you from the other documents. Now when you go to the land registry office, you walk in with your deed, they register it in a ledger book. I've actually gone through the one, I used to live in an old limestone house. The ledger book was started in 1796 on parchment, and every transaction was hand recorded. This is the ledger book for the, shows the original crown grant to Tobin in 1867. Then in 1882, Gilmore and Company bought the land from David Weiss. Now, Lot 31, which would have probably been 100 and some acres, can be subdivided into lots A, B, C, and D. So you can have one lot and a lot of different owners simultaneously, depending on how the land is divided. So I've highlighted a few of the um, things there, quite a few mentions of the uh, Mazana Boys Camp. Now, who worked on this? There's no records from this area of anything ever existing here, except in the book about the Gilmore Tramway up to Dorset, it mentions four men who had a lot of years experience, first-rate bush engineer, chief engineer, surveyor, civil engineer. These guys had experience when they went up to Dorset in 1893. Where did they gain all that experience? This was the big project that preceded it, so those men got their experience for the Dorset Tramway, which fortunately was very well documented. There's several books on it, and big displays up at Dorset of this uh, tramway. So we know the names of some people who got experience, but they weren't documented in this area. Here's a picture of the foot of the uh, tramway at Dorset. Now it consisted of several jack ladders and a flume. A flume is a big trough full of water, and they floated the logs one and a half kilometers. Those big pipes you see over the men's head are to take water from Lake of Bays to fill the flume at the end of this little jack ladder. And on the left in the straw hat is David Gilmore. The building you see in the back still stands. It's a lovely stone cottage. I've walked and examined this area, gone around with my metal detector. It's being picked clean of iron artifacts, and they are not in the Dorset Museum. So there's David uh, Gilmore on the left, and some of his uh, happy workers. Now you can see behind him the centrifugal pump. There's a centrifugal pump being powered, and there's rope drive over the drive shaft. There's the drive shaft, and that's to pump the water up to the flume. Thought just occurred to me. This is being recorded, and it'll show up better in the movies if we kill the lights. It'd be better for you and me to record it. Okay, so now you'll see on my little model up there that the engine house it shows rope drives and you can actually see that's what they used up at Dorset. This is the factory in Trenton. It's down at the foot of the Trent River on the east side. It's now a city park. They had three jack ladders to take the logs up there that were floated from this area, came up this jack ladder here, eventually ended up here, went up those jack ladders into the sawmill. These are uh, their drying yards where they dried the timber on the east side of the river. And they had railways going through. So that's where your lumber actually ended up. You can have a Gilmore band. I mean, this is the local sawmill, and you see they're using rounded logs, not square timber, as the one comment in the County of a Thousand Lakes said. Gilmore Hammer, you now have this in your uh, museum. I uh, had it located, belonged to a fellow in Ottawa who bought it at a flea market. He didn't know really what it was. We don't have the history on its origin, but I do have on the table here a record of the um, lumbermen's hammers that were used for branding the end of the logs. This is clearly a G. It is not in the book. The book cost $10 in the 1890s, and that was a week's wages. 
but it was a patent, a government registry of the various logging hammers. So I suspect this was used in the Ottawa River log watershed, maybe for logs coming down uh, the various rivers there, before that book, which is on the table, or part of it, was available. So there's the site of the Gilmore Hammer. It's for branding logs. When they got down to the mouth of the river, they knew who handled them, who, whose logs they were. Now, Gilmore had six of these hammers, six different ones registered. So the logs got to Trenton, they would know which route, which lumber area actually produced the logs that arrived at the sawmill. So here's a different one. You can see how they branded the end of the log, and then when they got to the destination, they could be sorted out and identified. Timber Marks Guide, it's on the table. And at the bottom are some of the uh, Gilmore's hammer marks, and on the next page. The one I showed you isn't there, but it may predate this book. Here's the men walking, working the logs, rounded timbers down the Scudamata River. Someday I'm going to track down this exact site. And you can see one of the pointer boats they used for getting supplies up and down the rivers. One of these may be my son's great-great-grandfather. It's possible. Now, to get the logs down Mazinaw Lake, they used big rafts with horses on them, turning a winch, and they winched the raft down the lake, pulling uh, booms of timber. The alligator boats with a steam engine that also winched logs across lakes didn't come along until 1890s. By 1900, when Algonquin was a hive of activity, they were everywhere. But this uh, logging on Lake Mazinaw predates the alligator boats. So this is how they got the logs down the length of Mazinaw Lake. And that's why you see it on the foot of the model. Square timber got to Quebec City, and you can see when you're going to take a sailboat across the Atlantic, you want it squared to pack as much usable timber inside a sailboat, but not for local consumption. So here are the men running the, this is halfway from Flinton to Scudamato Lake, uh, one of the waterfalls there, again, rounded timber, not squared timber. This is the model of the jack ladder system at Dorset. This museum is very similar to yours. So they have Lake of Bays. There's the alligator boat. They came along in 1890. This was built in 1893. There's our log boom. There's the engine house. And there's the pipes to pump water up to the flume. And they floated those logs uh, 200, sorry, about a kilometer and a half. Then they had eight jack ladders and a 450 horsepower water turbine powering eight of them. Now the total lift was the same as the one here. But you can see from the artifacts I have here, I only have them because it broke. And the tension at the top of the jack ladder was excessive, especially when you get giant pine logs, too many of them, on it. So what they did is they used the one water turbine, they used rope drives to each shorter jack ladders, each lifting the logs about 10 to 15 feet in elevation. Highway 117 came, comes right along underneath it, but this is all gone. I've walked that area with my metal detector, found nothing. I've walked that area, but not with my metal detector. <coughs> so back to Mazinaw Lake, Highway 41. This is a lower Mazinaw Heights Road, and you only go in a few hundred meters, and you will cross it. There's nothing to see from the road. On Highway 41, there's nothing to see. Down here, where the Addington Road number four ends, there's a swamp. It cuts right across the very end of the swamp, goes down to Pringle Lake, not Camp Gesher, goes around the cottage, owned by the McKeevers. Two brothers and their wives own the cottage. And they graciously let me go around there with them, and we found some good artifacts. Well, actually, that's where we found them. What I believe is the wheel, it was right there. Oops, wrong way. This is the foot of the jack ladder on Mazinaw Lake. You can see some rocks there, and looking in the water, there's some heavy timbers underneath the rocks, and that's where the jack ladder would have ended. So now we're pulling logs out of Mazinaw Lake to head west rather than east. At the foot of the model, you'll see there's a bit of a rock cut. And this is it, the jack ladder. They had to cut through the rock here to keep a steady gradient going up the hill. So they had to cut through that rock and it ran right up through there. 
I learned Richard Blackstock, who owns the land, went around with me one day, gave me a lot of valuable maps and uh, surveys and other documents. He's been very cooperative as well. He's walking down the hill, following where the jack ladder once went. So these trees all follow, well, they've been grown up since the jack ladder was there. You can see we're looking uh, up the hill, we put red ribbons on it, but uh, it's all overgrown. Now at the top of the hill, doesn't show up very clearly, there's a big pile of rocks, heavy cribbing of rocks, shows up on the survey. That, I believe, would have had heavy timbers around it, filled with rocks, because that's where the jack ladder gears were and the drive shaft shows up on my model there, where the ropes come out of the engine house and back in. And so the um, jack ladder was where I'm sitting here. The jack ladder would have been here, being driven from there, and then it's from the crib with lot of rock to keep it in. Now, when I was first there, I looked around, oh, that's all hilly. Why should I get concerned about a little bump like that? Except it looked too rectangular to be natural. It wasn't much to catch one's attention. There's no stone foundation, there's no wood. We went around there with a metal detector, we got hits all over the place. It was a bonanza. <laughs> now, that's where the engine house stood. The uh, rock cribbing is down here. So the engine house, they had to dig down because it had heavy machinery, a lot of vibration, a lot of tension. They had to get down to solid ground. Now this is a steam engine in front at Provincial Park. That's my loop. Show you what they probably had in the engine house. This is not located here, just to show you what they looked like. So they, we, I figured if the Mazin, oh, sorry, the Dorsal one used 450 horsepower to lift the logs about 90 feet. This one lifted logs 90 feet. It probably needed about four to 500 horsepower, something that size, burning wood. This is the tramway. The horses walked along the top of this on wooden rails with steel strapping. That is the tramway right there. Show you how it's overgrown. There is a little creek that cuts through there, seasonally providing water. And season, they did the logging in the springtime, so they had the water for the boilers there in the springtime. And the trains, were, the trams ran along there. Uh, it shows you some places built up quite high. But huge quantities of rocks and big rocks got moved around. Right now there's water running through there. It's a good spring of water. They may have used a tramway as a dam to hold back water for their boiler. Runs along the top here. This is not far from uh, South Addington Heights Road, South Mazinaw Heights Road. Very clearly a tramway would have run along the top. Uh, here's some more of it. This part is quite obvious. There's a pine tree that's grown on there since it was last used. And this is Pringle Lake at the McKeever's Cottage, and the, log, the uh, tramway went around the cottage. We found the path. McKeever's didn't know that when I visited. And I said, well, look at this elevated area in the trees behind your cottage. I said, this is where the tramway ran. We went around with my metal detector, found the wheels, some rails, uh, spikes and little doubt that the, the wagons circled the cottage and then they would have rolled the logs off the wagons down here. They could hold the logs here, float them down the end of uh, Pringle Lake, down the creek to Scudamata Lake and down the Scudamata River. I've done a lot of chasing these things and every time I find where there's been a lot of logging activities where the logs and land met the water or water met the land, I find these areas are man-made, uh, they're rock-free, they're tree-free. It's for holding logs till they're ready to take them out either on ice, on the ice, or float them away. So this fits in with the tramway, the nature of this land. Uh, there's a pattern to them. Sometimes if it's softer, there's a ring of rocks around the edge to avoid erosion from wave action. So that fits. So now the logs came down the Scudamata River. This is a dam that makes Scudamata Lake. Uh, there's, the other, there's the dam at the foot of Scudamata Lake We're going down the uh, Scudamata River. This is just north of Tweed. Uh, this is near Alata on the uh, Moira River. Logs would have come down there. Chisholm's Mills, they still do a lot of log cutting there, but the logs from here 
And off that jack ladder, would have gone over this dam. Here we are, spring flood. I paddle there every year. And I've been doing so for 50 years now. I'll be down there next week. Here we are going through Belleville. It's almost dried out. And finally, there's Sawmill in Trenton. So this is where your logs ended up. And you can see some of the short jack ladders to take the logs into the sawmill. Now, back to the top of the jack ladder, we found this heavy duty drive shaft and pulley, which indicates belt drive, not rope drive. Now, whether it was driving the upper little chain where they would load the wagons or driving the circular saw to cut the big logs, and small logs, and junk wood into firewood, I don't know. But that would not have driven the jack ladder, so it's for auxiliary power for one of their other functions. This is on top of the rock pile that was the cribbing, and you can see this drive shaft for belt drive. This is some of the iron strapping they would have used, a bunch of other odds and ends. This piece here, which I believe would be a clutch mechanism, is over there. And I believe by sliding it back and forth on a drive shaft, they can engage or disengage a gear on the moving shaft. This is the side of the rock pile. If the wood is all gone. Now they had a house there, we found a few iron beds, the bunks, and they were badly distorted, like the place burnt down rather than rotted away. There were also two barns show up on my 1950 topographical maps, and I haven't examined the site for those. There's one of the wells between the house and the jack ladder. It's about four feet deep, but that's where they got their drinking water, not far from the <coughs> south Mazinaw Heights Road. Found a frying pan and the sole of a canvas running shoe. <laughs> this is a map of, I believe, how it was laid out. We have Mazinaw Lake, jack ladder. That's where the uh, stone crib was, the engine house. We found a lot of fire bricks there. One was Snowball brand fire brick made in England, and the other was Rams and Patches fire bricks. So I believe that when the, they needed a repair job, the blacks, and they had to keep a blacksmith on hand. If that broke, all well, systems down. You go to the boiler with a shovel, get out a load, a hand load of coals, burning coals, to the blacksmith's bench, repair whatever needed to be done. So we found a lot of iron work there and there. The another drive shaft, this may be where they engage or disengage the gears. That may be where they had the belt drive. So the logs would come up here in a steady stream, but they need to stop this little loading platform while they loaded the wagons. The wagon would have to stop and roll a log off the wagon, off this upper loading platform onto the wagon, and then take it away. So that drive shaft I showed you may be from that, or it may be from a saw, table saw here where they had to cut the firewood to go into the boiler, and then a big tank of water, which also shows on my model. So I'm quite satisfied they had a setup very similar to that. No drawings of the day exist. But we do know for certain where the jack ladder ran, we know where the, wood, the stone cribbing is, and we know where the engine house was, and we know the tramway circle around on that side. That we know for certain. Here's some of the bricks from the uh, place, rams and patches, and Snowball. If you go online, look them up, you can find on the internet. Snowball brand was actually the name of the family in England that owned the brickworks. I kind of suspect they changed their name to fit the product. It doesn't stand the Snowball's chance in hell. We're making fire bricks, they sold them all over the world. It's a true story. We also found some other red, regular bricks may have come from Napanee Brickworks. Here's some of the iron straps. Now here's some bolts, 10 threads to the inch with very low profile heads. I believe that was used on the jack ladder because you couldn't put a big head on the bolt and have that yoke slide over it. We found square nails along the length of the tramway and the heads actually stood up above the strapping and the wheels would have rolled over the top of that to give you an idea of the length. So uh, where it's threaded, they could do repairs on it and they had to have a low head, but the heads broke off. So you go back to the blacksmith's shop, put a small head on it, and then uh, it's just screw down a little bit further. Mm -hmm. 
this actually, at first I thought, why was this dog going all about? But it turns out it's a link out of the chain. They can put a pin through there and there. It's on the table here, part of the chain. I couldn't figure out what this was. I showed it to another historian. He says, that is the tip of a pair of blacksmith's tongs. And so there would have been the pin through there and another one that clamped here and the handles up there and there. I don't know what this length of chain is for, but it's got a loop on each end. Any guesses? Any guesses what this would be for? I don't know. A harness? It might be. Are you telling me it is or asking me is it? Well, it's shaped like a harness, okay. For a horse. Yeah. And where would it have fitted? Through his mouth. No, no that would no. no. be a bit. No, that would be a bit. 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 I suspect that's what it was for, but I don't have enough horse experience to know. Thank you. Now, the tramway with the wooden rails and the wheels on it had eight inch thick steel strapping to prevent wear. But where you're dragging this chain up with heavy timbers on it and it's friction, you need a much heavier, much more durable strap. And look at this, it's tapered in thickness and that's tapered. But one overlaps the other and there's a hole for a, a bolt to go through and that would go over the end of the log anchoring it. So I believe that that log, sorry, the jack ladder yokes and chains slid over this, and you can see it on the table there. And that's how it would have fitted together, and there's one of the bolts with a low profile head. And it would have fitted in other places, but you cannot allow the head to stick up because the chain's going to slide over the top. And there's some more pieces. This piece is on the table. That's inch thick, but it had a piece on welded on here. It's a blacksmith weld, and the bottom end is broken off. That would have taken an enormous force to snap that. So I suspect that may have been one of the anchor points at the top of the jack ladder chain. This is carrying the load of the whole chain coming up the hill. This was found halfway along the tramway, and it's a heavy duty washer, probably to be broke off one of the wagons. This is the um, this piece, I believe it's a clutch to take power to the saw or the upper little jack ladder chain where they loaded the wagons and the pieces right there. That's my guess. This is the strapping from the wooden rail. So they had the wooden rails, the ties, the strapping. They had, they had a countersunk pole, but we found these nails along the length of it. Not many, but nonetheless, no railway tie rails, just those. We found steel strapping along the length of it, so I have to assume these heads stood up a little bit and the wheels rolled over it. There's the horseshoe. The horses they used back then were small draft horses. A very popular breed was called the Canadian. They almost went extinct. They were not a big draft horse, but they were reported to be very tough to buy on second-rate food, no food, turn them loose in the woods, they would browse on their own. You can see it's only five inches across. Anyway, the name of the horse that wore that was Nelly. Do you know how I know? Well, I found that horseshoe and I named the horse Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> Until somebody can dispute it, that's Nelly's horseshoe. It's going to appear one day in your museum. There's the chain, how it's assembled. You see coming up heavy wooden beams, the ties. Sliding along heavy duty strapping. Well, that's actually the strapping for the tramway, not the jack ladder. The jack ladder used the much heavier pieces. It shows you how all the links went together. Now, this is the yoke, and it has the cleats to grab the logs. But where the foot slides up the uh, iron strapping, it's actually at a 10 degree angle. They weren't exactly horizontal. The uh, jack ladder up at Dorset at Lake of Bays did not use these fancy cast iron yokes. They're straight iron bars, simpler construction, cheaper to make, straight across, and these would have been horizontal. This is a broken uh, yoke, and you can see probably it got driven from this side and it wore down a little bit, so it was going that direction. This shows you the cleat, which is an insert, and this broke off, showing uh, where the pins for the chain went through. A lot of the arms broke off, but if you had the thing stopped or a log jam or something like that, or a log not in straight, it's crooked, it's two feet in diameter, and all of your load is sitting on one side of the yoke 
and not on the other, or caught a crotch, uh, then all the load could be on one side, snapping those off. So the logs weren't necessarily evenly balanced across it. Here's the dimensions on it. I drafted it all out. To my knowledge, these dogs do not exist anywhere else in the country. Up at Dorset, they do not have any, have any jack ladder uh, chain pieces, and I don't know of any others in existence. And I've done a lot of internet searching. So what you have here is unique to my knowledge of the only ones around until I'm informed otherwise. Here is up at Dorset. There's the stone cottage, the engine house, the pipes pumping water up to the flume, rope drives, and there's their jack ladder cha chain. And you can see rough cut timber forming a V and the chain taking logs up from the lake to the flume. Those are very straight pieces. You can see the uh, cleats in them. So I'm zooming in here. Again, it's clearly a very simple yoke, just an iron bar, but the links in the chain are the same as what you've got. Here's a log being pulled out of Lake of Bays. It shows the yoke. The chain's links are the same as yours. But a yoke is just a straight iron bar. Therefore, the chain from the coin, a Masnod chain, did not go to Dorset. I don't know where it went, but I know it did not end up here. Now this is a fairly short jack ladder down at Lake of Bays past the engine house. Then there was a two kilometer long half flume and eight short jack ladders. They wouldn't have made one section with the chain from here and the other seven different. They would have all been the same. Therefore, I can reasonably conclude that the chain from here did not end up at Dorset. A couple of other pieces, a logger's pike, uh, a couple of other blacksmith's pieces. There's the bolts, low profile heads, square spikes holding the tramway ties down. Here's a blacksmith well that fell. This, I think, is off a horse uh, harness or anything. Anybody tell me what that is? Something to do with horses, maybe, be. Okay, we don't know. This, I was told, is a hook off a logger's chain. And the bottom end broke, but that would have been a logger's chain. And here's D, good one. Anybody know that? Spring off a bear trap. Yeah, a little patch of air, and it's rigid, you can't bend it. This, I believe, would be if the chain on the jack ladder broke, which it did, they would have to bring it up the hill. Well, it weighed eight tons, how do you get it up the hill? You have a device like that, a hook onto it, and maybe a rope or some other piece there, and they could push the chain up the hill, unless somebody else has another idea of what that is for. Anybody have another idea? The well, there's the chain, and there's a the ruler. It would have hooked on to the links of the chain and could be used to pull it up while they did a repair. Um, this is a pencil that's used for uh, barn doors. You drive it into a timber, and then the hinge of the barn door there. This was found in the engine house. And there's a big bolt that would have held the jack ladder together. Here's the wheel found by Pringle Lake, rolling on the steel strapping and the iron spike uh, holding it down. The iron strapping, the wheel, and the spike were all found down at Pringle Lake. There's a wheel on a three foot diameter uh, card table, just to show you the relative size. Some of the bricks, these are in your museum. There's a snowball brand one, but a lot of other interesting bricks around. Now we're back to here. We know that the uh, probably the wagons used here had fewer wheels, but they were three feet in diameter. This is the uh, now the scale here is out off. This is the Lake of Bays near Dorset. There, Dorset's off that way. Oh, about three or four kilometers. This is the alligator boat that would have brought the logs in. They did not have them here on Mazinaw Lake. There's the water turbines pumping the water up to here, and their jack ladder. Here's a heavy wooden crib holding all the gear works and the rope drives, and you have that here at the top of the jack ladder. And they fill it with rocks so it doesn't move. So you'll see that on my model, same idea. So by using the uh, documents from Lake of Bays, we can reverse engineer a little bit of what was going on here. Here's their alligator boat. They had at least one on Lake of Bays and the other up at uh, Tramway 
pond at the top of a jack ladder. This is the museum in Dorset, and this is their model of the jack ladder. They paid $25,000 for theirs. You're already up to $243. <laughs> they don't have any little people there showing what they do. I like the little people, it gives it a little bit of light. There's the engine house of Lake of Bays, and the jack ladder started down at uh, the cottage there, came up to here where then the logs went into the flume. The boiler was out there, a great big chimney there, so that's all gone. The boiler's gone. The steam engine, which was 900 horsepower, was in there. This is where the water turbine was for the Dorset one, and it powered eight short jack ladders and then a 450 horsepower water turbine, a jack ladder went along there. But again, you have all of these belt drives and chains, you need something heavy duty to anchor down, keep things in place, and that's what they use there. So the water turbine was there, sorry, water turbine was here, the jack ladder went up there. And this is the creek draining tramway pond and a few timbers in the creeks, and there's one of the timbers that were used to hold their jack ladder up. So you can see uh, mortise and tenon uh, construction. And there's Tramway Pond, that was man-made, there's my friend Kevin. And they made this pond so the uh, jack that had brought the logs up where Kevin is going. Then one of the alligator boats picked up a log in here and took it away to Raven Lake and uh, finally down the Gull River, eventually the Trent River, to Trenton where they arrived. Half of them arrived two years later. Here's the hill they had to go over, and this is the foot of the jack ladder. This was taken from the far end of Lake of Bays, so uh, I didn't quite get a good picture of it, but that's where it started. But you can see it's very hilly country, same ideas here. This house was the office of the um, Gilmore and Company in Dorset. Okay, now we're nearing the end. Uh, in Kingston at Ford Park, I painted this mural. There's about 20 murals. This is of the Kingston Pembroke Railway, honoring, um, this is the uh, Caldwell. The, the engines often had names. This is engine number three, Boyd Caldwell, coming into Clarendon Station. Clarendon Station is the only KMP station still standing other than the one by Kingston City Hall. There's a few other stations that still exist, but not in their original locations. There is the one from Calabogie, and it got moved down Highway 511, it's in the backyard of somebody, it's being used as a garden shed, it's in my book, and it got moved from Calabogie. I was showing that to a lady from the area, she says, oh no, 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 that one in your book is not from Calabogie, that's from Berryville. I said, how do you know that? She hesitated, said, well, my brother and his friends, when they were boys, were playing in the Calabogie station, and they accidentally burnt it down. <laughs> <laughs> this one is from Barry's Hill. Now, I can't dispute that fact, but by putting it in publication, even though I can't fix it, it's a good story, so when you go in my book, it is not from Calabogie, it's from Barryville on the other side of Calabogie Lake. But if you don't go out and speak to people, you can't learn these things. And here's my portable museum I take all over the countryside, my wife Myrna, my friend Kevin, and he's really got uh, hooked on this project. And he liked to bring little boys and their dads, he got a picture in front of our steam engine. If you like that steam engine, it was $17 shipped to me direct from China with a shower curtain. <laughs> I have a lot of minerals there, a lot of uh, displays of spikes, a working telegraph machine, candlestick phone, and other stuff in there. And this is me at Smith Falls or Museum, Railway Museum. This was a Canadian Northern Railway. A couple of weeks ago in Kingston City Hall, giving a presentation on the evolution of the early waterways and railways of Kingston's Inner Harbor area. Here I am on the morning show, CKWS TV, and one of my friends helped me write the book, uh, Sir John A. MacDonald. Oh, sure. <laughs> and there's my book. I've got six railways done extensively, nine tramways, but I do a lot of the early roads, colonization roads, milestones, corduroy roads, floating log bridges, 
If it was used more than 100 years ago to move stuff around, I'm going to go and track it down and research it. And uh, no amount of effort is too much. In fact, the harder it is, the more I love it. And that's the end of the presentation.